all of you. It's great to see you. Praise the Lord. And uh, all of you that are joining us on Facebook, we appreciate you so much. I especially want to speak to our brother Urban in Pakistan. It's great that uh, he makes that uh, kind of that long stretch, praise the Lord. I know it's, it's no distance for God, but uh, amen. I appreciate him being a part of the service as well. And everybody that's out there joining us on Facebook online, uh, you are a part of this service, and we appreciate you uh, participating and we're praying that God is blessing you as he blesses us. And as we pray for you, we, we pray that you will continue to pray for us and the entire body of Christ. We all are one, regardless of our geographic location. Amen. We're all one in Christ. So God bless all of you and appreciate again you being with us today. Praise the Lord. Amen. So God is good, right? And uh, again, I just want to say that... Uh, I just Let me just do this. This is really stupid, but I can't help myself because it's this is who I am, praise the Lord. But there was a, in a really sick way, this has something to do with my message, but in, in the wrong kind of way probably, but you know, God will forgive me for it because he knows me. But there were these two guys in the wilderness and they were starving to death. There was no food. They couldn't find food anywhere. They were really struggling. And uh, one of them saw this tree and he said, my God, he said, that's a, that's a bacon tree. And the guy looked at him and said, come on. No, he said, I'm serious. It's a bacon tree. And they started running towards it, and they got up close to it. And they, he said, it, it, it is. It's a bacon tree. And about that time, two guys jumped out from behind the tree with guns. And the other guy said, no, it's not. It's a ham bush. Oh. <laughs> He's the Lord. I told you it was bad, but that's, <laughs> amen. Praise God. So God is good, amen, amen. all the time, amen. amen. And uh, I appreciate Suzanne sharing with us this morning. Part of, you know, a lot of what she was saying is, uh, you know, connected with what I would like to talk to you about this morning. And, and part of that is, because we just approach it from different ways, but I, so much of the body of Christ thinks that, has this feeling that they're not adequate. Mm -hmm. That there's something missing in them. I mean, I'm talking about individually, but of course that affects us collectively. But I hear it a lot that God won't use me because I'm, I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers. I don't, how, I can't hear from God. I don't hear the Lord speaking to me. And, and of course, then when you have people that do hear the Lord and are very demonstrative about it, it makes people feel even more inadequate. You know what I'm saying? And that's not to take any way, thing away from the people who are uh, outspoken, and we need that. I mean, we have to have that. But there's also uh, other people that struggle with this. And uh, the supernatural, you know, they have this kind of this mentality that it, the, the supernatural is just beyond me. I mean, I'll do some good stuff. I'll do some good works. But, you know, the, the miraculous is not something that I can really participate in personally. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I want to be a part of it, but I, I just don't do it. And so there's, there's a lot of people that feel that way. But I just want to say that this is about operating from the knowledge of the finished work of Christ. But so much of the body of Christ operates from the knowledge of good and evil. And that just simply means we're so aware of our shortcomings. And, and the enemy doesn't have to say much. He can, just a little whisper, you know, and all of a sudden we're in defeat. We're, we're thinking, my God, you know, I, I thought I was past that. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And that's what he does because he knows what potential you have for the kingdom of God. So he has to, he has to sow these seeds of inadequacy, these seeds of, of guilt or lack when you are such a powerful yes. creature in Christ and he knows that the only thing the only weapon he has to use against you is your own mind yes. is to try to trick you into believing that you are incapable of doing anything for God on a big scale oh yeah you might be nice to the neighbor or you might loan a buck here to somebody you know that's that's all good but God's trying to get you to convince of the potential that you have in Christ to just change this world, literally. Amen. To literally make that kind of an impact 
in this world. Praise the Lord. So with that in mind, I want to I want to talk to you this morning about something that God has been dealing with me about. And I find I, I'm just getting to where I'm I, I'm going in every direction imaginable. So good luck keeping up. Hey, Amen. It's, it's not that I'm random. It's just that I talk faster than you can think. Hallelujah. So but anyway, just stay with me. OK, so let's begin, Peter. Let's start in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 14. And again, I'll probably be all over the map here, theologically speaking, but uh, amen. I think I've got some, I've got some good uh, cartographers with me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And we'll end up in the same place eventually. Hallelujah. So in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 14, it says, And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Psalms 103, verses 10 through 12. Psalms 103, verses 10 through 12. Praise the Lord. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. So, we have to come to an understanding of how important we are in God's creation. We're not just here to take up space. We're not just here to, you know, to, to add more people. We're not just here just to multiply. God told Adam and Eve to multiply, but there's way more to our purpose here than that. Amen. We are to be one with God. We are to be God in this earth, to give him access to this do domain. Praise the Lord. So, Kedem is a Hebrew word for east. And the temple of Jerusalem was built according, the scripture says, according to the east or according to the Kedem. It had to face east. Amen. And the altar of sacrifice was at the easternmost end of that. And the Holy of Holies was at the westernmost end or the opposite end from where the sacrifices were. And everything else was in between. So the temple existed on an east west continuum and a continuum is just simply a a, a continuous whole uh, something that isn't you know it, the parts can't be separately or separately discerned just okay so everything that took place in the temple took place on an east west continuum the high priest would offer up the sacrifices in the east. We just described where the, where the altar was. And then he would sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant in the west to the opposite end, to the other, in the other direction, right? So the last thing that he would do at the close of the, of the day when they were offering up the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement when he would go into the Holy of Holies, amen, would symbolically see the sins of the people removed away from the temple into the east of the wilderness by the scapegoat or the sacrificial lamb. So the earth, now here's the picture God's trying to give us. You say, well, they didn't know this when the Bible was written. They didn't have to. God knew. And all they were doing was writing down what he said. Amen. And so, I, in fact, my son-in-law was talking to me here a few weeks back. He'd read something in a, uh, somewhere. I don't remember now where it was. But anyway, it was interesting. And it was, but it was about... The flat earth theory. I mean, come on. This is 2021, but we still got people out there. It's flat earth. It, it, where in the Bible does it say? Well, it says God set on the circle of the north, you know, so God knew the earth was round, obviously, since he created it or, you know. But there are people out there still arguing about some of the most basic things in the world, right? But the earth is it's a, a sphere, Amen. And it turns on its axis on an east-west continuum. This is what you learned in, I don't know, sixth 
or seventh grade probably. I don't remember exactly when I learned it, but I back went there somewhere. Amen. So the because of this, it's on a sphere and it turns on an axis on an east-west continuum. And so the Earth has a north pole and it has a south pole. This is all really revelation to all of you, I'm sure, but it's good. Praise the Lord. So there's no east pole and there's no west pole, right? The distance from the north to the south is finite, right? All north comes to an end at the north pole. And all south comes to an end at the south pole, right? Because once you get past the south pole, you're going north, okay? So if the temple had been built on a north-south continuum, then your sin would have been removed just a few thousand miles from you. Okay? God knows what he's doing, church. I'm telling you, he knows. So, praise the Lord. Here, here's the deal. How far is the east from the west? Well, the east and the west have no poles. So they never end. As long as you're pointing east, you're going east. I mean, Columbus figured this out, yeah. to some degree at least. So they never end. East and west are infinite. Yes. North and south are finite. They have a, a place where it stops being north and becomes south. But east and west are infinite. East and west go on forever. In fact, the Hebrew word for east, kadem, also means everlasting. Wow. Amen. So in Jesus... How far does God remove your sins from you? Yes. Praise the Lord. An infinity away is what he's telling us. An eternity away is where God takes your sin. Amen. And if you had all of eternity, you could never find him again. Amen. So far as he removed our sins away from us, as far as the east is from the west. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to pray a prayer. This is an ancient Hebrew prayer. It's a legitimate, real, ancient Hebrew prayer. And it will lead us into what I want to teach about this morning, beyond where we've already been. That was just a premise, just to set us up for where I think God wants us to go. Amen? It is a tree of life to those who grasp it. And happy are those who cling to it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are shalom. Bring us back to you, Adonai, and we will return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Praise the Lord. So that's a prayer that has been prayed for millennia by the Jewish people. It's a tree of life to those who grasp it, they say. And happy are those who cling to it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness. And all its paths are shalom or peace. Yes. Bring us back to you, Adonai. Yes. And we will return. Renew our days as of old. Praise the Lord. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Praise the Lord. Yes. Chapter 3, verse 22 through 24, Peter. Praise God. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now let us put forth his hand and take also of the, at lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden 
of Eden, cherubims and a flaming sword, and turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and have that more abundantly. Praise the Lord. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and he created mankind to embody the ideal union between heaven and earth, the connection between heaven and earth. Amen? And that ideal union is revealed in the name of the first man, Adam. Adam. Amen? In Hebrew, Adam means man. I know we hear all kinds of translations, but that's the, the basic translation, the most common. Man. And it's made up of three letters, Aleph, Dalet, and Mem. Man, who is a microcosm of creation, has a physical body and a spiritual life. A physical life, a spiritual life. Amen? And Adam's name, or Adam's name, can be broken into three parts. Actually, into two parts, three letters. The Hebrew letter Aleph represents the spiritual aspect of man. Because the name of God used in creation, uh, when the, the account of creation that we read in Genesis 1, is Elohim, which also begins with the letter Aleph. So that's where Adam gets his spiritual side. Amen. That's the connection, the spiritual part of mankind. The other two letters in Adam's name, man, Dalet and Mem, spell blood. And in Hebrew, that points to the physical aspect of the humanity, right? Makes us humans. We got blood running in our veins, right? The image of God can only be fully expressed or completely known. He says, we are created in the image of God. In the image of God created he them. Male and female, he created them, right? So in the image of God, the only, we can only be fully expressed when the physical and the spiritual aspects of humans, represented by those three letters of Adam, are completely connected. Aleph, right? Dalet and Mem. It takes all three of them. And that connects us. It's a, it's a picture of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Of the spiritual and the natural. Or the physical. Amen? So... Satan's goal is, what did he do when he was cast down? He destroyed the earth. That's why we had the creation that we read about in Genesis 1. He, he is the one who created the chaos and the destruction that God then came and created or recreated the earth and put man on it. Amen? So his goal hasn't changed. It's for humanity to focus on our physical at the expense of our spiritual. So we become no better than animals. So that we're no longer bearing God's image, but just we're in the world, but instead of bearing God's image, we're bearing the mark of the beast. 666. Right? That's his goal. That's what he's after. That's what he's always been after. Chaos and confusion. And bring man down below him, yeah. back to the animal level, to where he doesn't, you know, I mean, that's the scripture, and we've all heard about it. What is man that thou art mindful? That's Satan talking. He's upset because God has elevated man above the angelic yes. realm, yes. and it's God, man, angels, animals, so forth. Yeah. He's always trying to constantly bring us back down to the animal level beneath yeah. th his authority. Yeah. Amen. So the fall can be summarized by one word, exile. Praise. That Hebrew word is gola. And the antidote to exile is redemption, which is gela. In Hebrew, there's only one letter difference between exile and redemption. It's the letter Aleph, the letter of God's name. So when the Lord is removed from our lives, 
from our families, from our nation, from the world. What we have left is what we see on the six o'clock news every night. Yeah. <laughs> Chaos. Chaos and confusion, division and strife, anything to create hatred and anger and frustration and fear, anything that the devil would want to promote. Yeah. Right. Amen? So we're left in chaos and exile. The creation account is where it all began for us. It's where it all began for the entire world today. It wasn't written. The creation account was not written to give us some in-depth, detailed, scientific history of how the universe came into being. Instead, it sets the foundation for this much larger story, this, this biblical tre treatise, amen, which focuses on relationship, on redemption, and restoration. Praise the Lord. The journey of life, of eternity for that matter, is from the knowledge of good and evil, from sin consciousness and shame, to God knowledge, yes. to righteousness, yes. to holiness, to the righteousness of God in Christ right. Jesus. Yes. That's what this life is all about. That's why you can have millions and millions of dollars but never get this revelation and be miserable. Right. Still your life can be in chaos and confusion right. and hatred. And, right? And you can be just eking out a living yep. and be the happiest, right. have the most joy why? Because you found the truth of what this is all about. You found the righteousness of God in Christ. You have hope that your life can be transformed, that your life can be changed. Amen? Ultimately, everything is narrowed down to one of two realities. The saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Spirit, or guilt, condemnation, and shame, flesh and the devil. Amen? Amen? We live every day of our lives in one of those two realities. In fact, you could say we live every minute of our lives in one of those two realities. We may get up in the morning and we're full of the Holy Ghost and we're excited and we're you know, speaking in tongues and we're, we got the victory. And by noon, we've had to deal with so many devils. We're so full of guilt. We're so full of shame because we've retaliated in many cases. If you're like me, hallelujah, you know, just driving in traffic, you get the, you know, the one finger wave. And yeah. next thing you know, you know, you're just thank God I didn't bring the weapon with me today. Hallelujah. You know, I mean, who knows what we might end up being. It's just stupid. But that's what the devil does. So every minute and every day is this conflict, is this kind of a warfare between the righteousness of God in my reality, my identity, or yeah. sin, shame, guilt, which can be just as real to me as the other. Why? Because God knows when I'm standing in the righteousness of God in Christ, nothing is impossible yes. for me or for God. Right. When I'm standing in guilt and shame, there isn't much I can do, and there's not much God can do with me. But the enemy can trip every trigger I have. He can push every button. He can get me into every yeah. kind of mess and, and stupid action and behavior yeah. under the sun. Amen? Mm -hmm. So that's what we live with. That's where we are. Amen? Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Praise the Lord. And it is like Suzanne said. We have this. You know, we just got to wake up to what we have. We, and that, that really, in my understanding, and again, I'm just guessing at this because haven't, haven't, they haven't given me an outline because they don't have one. But my sense is this is just letting God be God. Hallelujah. Don't know what it's going to be. We don't know any more than, like I said, Azusa Street or any of those kind of revivals. They didn't have agendas. They just went in and people would go in. They'd be praying. They'd, some people would come. And just feel like God said, say this or share this or whatever. And they did. And it may look like, my God, this is who knows what is going on here. Let's just trust God. Yeah. 
On the day of Pentecost, I guarantee you, it looked pretty flaky. It looked pretty weird when you got all these people speaking in tongues and everybody's working and doing and every, they're going, they must be drunk. What the heck is going on here? There's no rhythm or rhyme to any of this. It doesn't make sense. And yet God was moving in such a powerful way. That's what we have to give ourselves to. We need a little bit of, you know, kind of... Uh, maybe controls within a church setting simply because there's teaching going on. But it doesn't have to be confined to that. If God wants to move, I want him to move. I'll shut up in a heartbeat if he'll just, you know, if he wants to move me out of the way, have at it, right? Well, this is an opportunity for that to be the priority. And then let other things come from that. That's what I see. That's what I sense of it, you know, so... Let God be true and every man a liar. Whatever happens, happens. And it isn't like we have a checklist or it isn't like they have, you know, if we get this accomplished, then we've succeeded. No, they've succeeded already just simply by being obedient and doing what they feel God is wanting them to do. Because I think that's the path that God is trying to take us on in these last days where there's more of that so that you can do that when you're in your workplace. So you can do that when you're, you know, at the grocery store at Walmart or wherever it might be that you are, you'll have the, the sense that, well, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do, I'm up for it. Right? Just to, to be led by the Spirit. Yes. Amen. So, the Lord God planted a garden eastward mm-hmm. in Eden. Mm-hmm. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. Now notice this. Out of the ground is the same place he took Adam. Right. Yeah. So out of the ground, God chose to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are there on the eastern end of the garden Mm -hmm. along with Adam, the dirt man, praise the Lord. All right, chapter 3, verse 17 through 24. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, <laughs> for I'm, not even gonna, I'm not saying nothing, praise the Lord, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, now, but the truth is, she got the shaft there, because Adam knew and she didn't. And Adam didn't tell her. But Adam did cooperate in the wrong that she was doing, even though she didn't really know that she wasn't supposed to, praise the Lord. So anyway. And hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now it's interesting too, because this is also coming out of the dirt, right? We'll get to it here in a minute. But in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Praise the Lord. So, eastward, still dealing with the east-west continuum. One One of the results of the curse when the fall took place, is that from the ground, thorns and thistles now are going to sprout, right? The word sprout in Hebrew is tatzmiak, which is the verb form of tzimak, which means branch. Okay, so Zechariah, let's look at this, Zechariah chapter 6. Verse 11 and 12. I throw these Hebrews in there simply because that will confuse you and you won't know if I'm on course or not, praise the Lord. Seriously, there's a lot of meaning yeah. that we miss a lot of times just from the English translations. Right. And so it's, I think it's, it's relevant. So uh, in Zechariah 
6 verse 11 it says then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest and speak unto him saying thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying behold the man whose name is the branch and he shall grow up out of this his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord amen so here the branch is associated with Yahashua, amen, the priest. But he's not the branch, but the branch are gonna ha is going to have the same name yeah. as this priest has. Amen. So it's a prophetic coming from, from Zechariah, right? Yeah. Now let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Romans 8, 1 and 2. I told you I was going to be everywhere. But I have more fun putting these together than you have listening to them. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Chapter, or excuse me, eight, verses 18 and 19. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So there are all these creatures, all these people who are still have not identified with their being elevated above the demonic back into the position just below God. Amen. And above the angelic, whether they're fallen or not, mm -hmm. above the beasts, right? Mm -hmm. Those are waiting for us. Yes. Not because we exist, but they need a manifestation. They need to see something yes, that identifies with our yes. true identity. That's what this world is crying out for. They don't know what they're looking for. They don't know what they're begging for. They don't know what they're angry about. They don't know why there's such hatred and malice. It's because they're, everything in them is crying out for a manifestation of the church, of the body of Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, amen. Uh, verse uh, 28 through 34 now. Still in 8, Romans 8. Verse 28 through 34. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, the branch, yep. that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Remember, we're still talking about the tree of life. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he glorified. What are they looking for? The glory, right? Mm -hmm. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Yes. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Mm -hmm. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's us. Who's, I don't, you know, who, who is laying that charge to you? It's the devil. It's the enemy. It's your own mind when it's not renewed to the word of God about your true identity. Amen. Amen. Who? He's saying, it's a rhetorical question. He's just saying, who? I'll tell you who. It's your unregenerated mind and the devil. It's not God. He's already declared you righteous. He's already declared you holy. He's already declared you. Yes. Amen. Equal to Jesus. Yes. It is God that justifies, it says. Who's? Who do they think they are? It's God that justified you, not the devil, not yourself. Right. Amen. Right. Who is he that condemneth? Yeah. It's Christ that died. Yes. Yea, rather that is risen again, mm -hmm. who is even at the right hand of God, who yes. also maketh intercession for us. Yes. So every time I do screw up, he's saying, no, yep. remember the blood. Yes. Remember the blood. Remember the nail scar. Yes. Remember the, huh? No, he's, uh, he's righteous, he's innocent, he's good, right? Praise the Lord. So the, the purpose or the plan originated in this un unfathomable past beyond our ability to even comprehend. Back before the foundation of the world, before creation, who knows where. 
before time. Yeah. Amen? And it was known in advance. It was determined in advance. Yes. Yeah. It's going to happen, church. I'm just saying, yeah. it's just a question of who's going to get on board. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And it continues on into the world to come. Yes. Glorified. Yes. Offspring of God. Yes. That's us. Yes. The glory. Yes. Praise God. Verse 30, if you can go back there, Peter. Look at this. This is, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. If you catch the drift here, it's all past tense. Yes. Amen. It's all done. It's all historic events. Praise the Lord. Amen. Past tense is showing that every, even, even though we, in our finite natural self, in our physical being, in our natural way of thinking, amen, have a limited human viewpoint. I mean, we think glorification is still in the future. I'm going to be in the glory. I'm going to be glorified. No, you are glorified. He said you were glorified. You are already glorified. That's one of those things we got to get past this natural way of thinking, amen, because the devil wants to tell you, you're glorified, come on. Man, I watched you yesterday. I seen what you did. I heard what you said. Well, watch this. I am the glory of God in this earth. I am glorified. He said I was glorified. Just like he said your butt was whipped and you no longer have access to heaven. You know that's the truth because you can't get back there. Well, you can know this is a fact as well. Glorification has already taken place. Amen? It's not in the future. From God's viewpoint, it's already accomplished. And this is why we need the mind of Christ. He said you have the mind of Christ. Put on the mind of Christ. You have access to it. You're just not taking advantage of it. You're letting your human, your dumb and down thinking, control too much of your life. You've got to get bold with yourself. Amen. When you, you know, when your mind is saying, oh, come on, Sally, you can't do that. Oh, Nathan, you, you know, you, you, need to get, you need to get right in your own face and say, hey, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a child of God, man. I am the glory of God. Back off. You got no business messing here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, I want to read verses 9 through 21. We got to quit messing around in church. I mean, as the church. Listen, I got born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues in a very religious Pentecostal church. Thank God for it. But I'm still unraveling stuff that got so woven into me that even though I was born again, speaking in tongues, I was beating myself up. And if I didn't do it, all I had to do was go to church and they would do it for me. You know what I'm saying? In the body, we have ways of just pointing our fingers and, and all of a sudden we take on these, these guilt trips and you don't even have, you can be talking positive to somebody and they're taking it as a guilt that you're trying to put something on them because it's so innate, it's so incorporated into their being. We've got to get past this. We've got to be bold. We've got to be arrogant about this. We've got to get, when, when somebody says, hey, you know, you just, hey, shut up the heck up praise the lord i am somebody i am the righteousness of god in christ i mean i'm, I'm gonna tell you i've told this story before but it, it resonates with me I, i'll never forget it we were we were having a tent meeting is when we started a church in ankeny and it's right after we come up here from texas first work we did was we we started a church there and we were having a tent meeting and we had a big tent and i had this guy from texas he had a man he was a great uh, he, he had a, like a photographic memory. He could quote scriptures all day long, you know, just on and on. I couldn't even find some of them in the Bible, but he was, he's, he, I was, he was capable of doing it. He was a great preacher and a good guy. But anyway, a friend of mine who was also a pastor, who at the time was pastoring in, maybe I shouldn't say, yeah, who cares. Uh, <laughs> Well, I won't say it because I can't remember. Praise the Lord. Huh? Yeah, maybe so. Anyway, it was here in Iowa. And uh, 
And I ministered for him, pastor, uh, and uh, preached for him, and he had preached for me. And in fact, then he ended up coming to our church and, and working as an assistant for me for a while, too, before we left the church there. But anyhow, he and his wife came. And look, this is life 101, okay? So I'm just being honest with you. And he and his wife, and he's a pastor, and he had come from Indiana, I think is where he had pastored originally, somewhere further east of here. But he came here and he was pastoring a pretty good sized church here in Iowa south of here and uh they came up and we were standing there and we were just talking to different people that were coming and and so on and so forth and he came up and his wife said something to him i don't remember what it was she played piano she was a great piano player had a beautiful voice really nice they were good people they were a lot of fun but they were people you know what i mean and uh he she said something smart and snipe you know snarky to him and and he said, talk to me like I am somebody. <laughs> I mean, now this is a pastor, so, you know, you kind of know where he's coming from. But I almost burst out laughing when, when he said that, because I thought, if I said that to Sally, she'd, I'd still be red. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's just the, that was their relationship. But I, I'm just saying, hey, they're pastors, but they're still a husband and wife. And, you know, how, come on, let's go. We can rub each other the wrong way sometimes. And stuff gets said. And. So anyway, that's what he said. Talk to me like I am somebody. And I just started laughing. I mean, I couldn't help myself. And they looked at me like, how rude, you know. <laughs> I thought, come on, man. Get a clue, you know. So anyway, I, I don't know why, even why I brought that up, except that it just went through my mind. But anyhow. No, I'm just saying, we have this idea that we, that our behavior has to totally match our identity. We want it to. But we know we come short. But it doesn't change our standing in God. And this is a thing because when we do something like that, then, then you got, I mean, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, and I'm sure, I'm sure you do to some degree. But we've had issues and stuff, and then i got to come and preach. That's not easy. No. Ever happened to you, Tim? No, don't tell me because you're white. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. You, you, you'll have a conflict. It doesn't necessarily have to be your wife, but it can be anything. And just something rubs you and you, you kind of react. And, and then now you, you're going, oh, my God, you know, I feel like such a hypocrite, you know. Yeah. No, that's what the devil's wanting. Yeah. God knows we're, yes. you know, we, we have flesh and blood. We just give it to him. I repent. God, I got to move on. I can't just, you know, run and hide now because I said something stupid. I got to live my life. I got to do what I got to do. Amen. <laughs> Making you feel better, isn't it, Tim? Praise the Lord, you're not the only one out there. Glory to God. I'm looking for an amen, brother, because I need that feedback. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. So you know what I'm saying. We're just, we got to get past this or we can't do anything. I mean, suppose that something like that would happen, and then we come in and somebody comes in and wants prayer for healing. Yeah. What's the first thing the devil says? Well, it won't be you. God ain't going to be using you half-wit after the last thing you did. Right? And he does that to all of us. Yes. That's why we've got to be able to separate the flesh yes. from the spirit. Yes. We've got to identify with who our real identity, who yes. we really are. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not endorsing stupid behavior, but let's face it. We're humans, so we're, the stupid stuff will happen. But we cannot let that right. determine our ministry. We can't let that determine our identity in Christ. Yeah. We've got to be obedient to the yes. spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, did I do that? Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, yeah, Ephesians, here we go. I'm back to where I started. Hallelujah. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now Unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Angels, yeah. fallen and unfallen angels, yeah. are looking to us. Yeah. We want to get all freaked out about angels. Believe me, angels are paying way more attention to us than we are to them. Yeah. And they should be. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, which is authority over those principalities and powers. Yes. Amen. Just under God. Yes. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence yes. by the faith of him. Yes. 
Wherefore I desire that you faint not yes. at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, but for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Yeah. Because we're going to get to this in a little bit too. <clears throat> for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Mm -hmm. You got a name. And it's not Paul. It's not John. It's not Toby, it's not Jody, right? It's not Karen, it, it, right? That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, for your name's sake, amen, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man and who you really are, amen, that Christ may dwell in your hearts or in your spirit by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, God is love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height. Amen. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. The love of Christ is what delivered us, that set us free, that made us children of God, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. His name is our name. That's why when we come to God, we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, in case you don't recognize me, I didn't shave this morning or whatever. In the name of Jesus, I'm coming in the name, hallelujah, that has been given me, yes. amen, whereby I can get all things, yes. Yes. amen, that pertain to life and godliness. So the prophet Zechariah revealed the hidden name of the Messiah to be Yahashua or Yeshua, the branch. Yes. Amen. Now eating from and receiving the knowledge of good and evil from one tree cuts us off from the access to another tree, the tree of life. Nothing has changed. So when you eat from the knowledge of good and evil, when you're drawing your sustenance from that, you have cut yourself off from the tree of life, yes. from God life. You understand what I'm saying? God is making it clear to us. Yes. Nothing has changed. We're still battling the same thing. That's why he tells us, where was it put? The east end of the garden. But he tells us, we live in an east-west continuum. Yes. There's no end. Right. What goes around comes around. Yes. We have access yes. if we're in Christ. Yes. I'll show you what I mean. We're either operating in the physical or the spiritual. Right. We're either eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're getting our strength. We're getting our energy. We're getting our wisdom. We're getting whatever it is. We're getting it from there. Or we're getting it from the tree of life. Yes. It's, it's that simple. It's that fundamental. We can make it all kinds of other theology, but the bottom line is you're eating one place or the other. Right. And whichever one you're eating from is going to be... Yeah. Yeah. Huh? You are what you eat, yeah. right? Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 9, yeah. verse 6 and 7. And I'm saying all this just so that when the next time that thought comes, yeah. say, uh -uh. no, I know better than this. Yeah. That's the reason for the repetition. That's the reason for everything that I'm saying is to find something that will stick. Yeah. Just one word. Maybe it's a Hebrew word. Maybe it's something else that you never heard before, but it will resonate with you. And then the next time the enemy comes, that will pop up in your head. And you go, ah, wait a minute. I know you. I know where you're coming from, buddy. And I ain't biting. I'm not hungry for that. I'm full. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm full of the tree of the knowledge of life. Hallelujah. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase, and this is what's important, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Of the increase of his government. Now that word, 
or those words, those three words, of the increase of his government and shalom, or his peace, there shall be no end. The Hebrew letter mem, we talked about it in David, the Hebrew letter mem in that phrase of the increase is grammatically incorrect. I was an English major. I didn't know anything about anything, much of it, anything else. I don't know that I could even diagram a sentence, but I knew what sounded right. <laughs> you know, I took phonics. Remember phonics, guys? Yeah. So we knew how to talk, even though we didn't maybe understand the English language. We just knew what sounded right. That sounds right. That, that ought to work, praise the Lord, if it didn't know that there was an adverb or a vowel, or, you know, or a pronoun or whatever. Praise the Lord. But anyhow, of the increase of his government. So that Hebrew letter mem in that phrase of the increase is grammatically incorrect. And the reason it is is because in Hebrew, there are two ways to write the letter mem, open or closed. Now, the letter mem, and I know uh, Israelis would probably choke me if they heard this, but I'm just going to say it, it looks like a, like a very stylized square. It, you know, from a Western perspective, it would just look like a, kind of like a box, a square, mm -hmm. but it's very stylized. But the mem gets its name from its shape, and so there's an opening on the left side of it. The open mem, see there's two mems. The open mem can be used anywhere in a Hebrew word except as the last letter. Okay? The closed letter mem, also known as the final mem, is only used when the letter comes at the end of a word. So the open one can't be used at the end. The closed one can only be used at the end. Okay? All right? So why is the closed or the, the final, because it's also called the final mem, why is the closed or final mem used in the expression of the increase? Lama rabbah is what the word is. The rabbis teach it this way. The letter mem can also represent a woman's womb. And so an open mem represents an open womb. Look at Ruth chapter 1 verse 11, just for a quick example. And Naomi's speaking, and she's speaking from a natural perspective, right? And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet not any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? So she's just talking about a natural womb, the potential of the ability to give birth, right? The ability for a woman to conceive <clears throat> in a normal way. Amen. And so in Isaiah 9, verse 7, the mem is closed, which alludes to the fact that the Messiah would be conceived miraculously mm -hmm. through a woman with a closed womb, mm -hmm. right? One who should not naturally be able to have a child. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm talking about where the Hebrew comes in. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Stuff that we just don't normally think of. No, we know the fact of this. We know the truth of this. But it's just interesting to see how it's woven, you know, into their into their scripture. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 tells us the very thing. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you'll call his name Emmanuel. A closed womb is going to bear a child. Amen. And here's also interesting. That young woman that bore Yeshua, or Jesus, is Mary, which is Miriam in Hebrew, which also begins with the letter Mem and ends with the closed Mem. Amen. So look at Isaiah 9 and 6. And that's where this all comes together here, and I'm just going to throw a few things out here just to show you the, the connection that they're making here. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So we know, based on the very next scripture and the increase, right, that he's supernatural. This guy is not a normal birth. This is something from heaven. Amen. And then they validate that by these very scriptures. Look at Genesis chapter 21, verse 33. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Mm. Talking about this 
miracle child that's going to be born, right? Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord everlasting. Amen. Amen. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Yes. Psalms 40, verse 5. We're, giving all, we're, we're, we're relating this to God, the Creator. And God, the Creator, is saying, I'm coming. I'm coming through a closed womb, through a closed mem. Praise the Lord, supernaturally. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, mighty God. Amen. Judges, chapter 20, verse 18. I'm just doing a few of them here just to give you an idea. They're all through the Bible. You can find them everywhere. But Judges, chapter 20, verse 18. The children of Israel rose up and went to the house of God and asked counsel of God. The counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yeah. Genesis 49, verse 24. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God, everlasting Father, the mighty God. Mm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. The Messiah, Emmanuel, Adonai, everlasting God. The I Am yes. became incarnate yes. in Yeshua, in Yeshua, in Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. So the Messiah would eventually... Usher in a time of peace, the Prince of Peace. Time of prosperity. And the entire world is going to experience this at some point, yes. right? In other words, the Messiah would be both human and divine. So let me just be like Jesus and tell you, I'm talking about you. Yes. He blasphemes. No, I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Yes. Yes. You are human, and you are divine. You are born from above. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. You had a natural birth, yes. but you also had a closed womb birth. Yes. Glory. Praise the Lord. And let me tell you this. You know the scripture, I read this a lot of times. And in fact, I was talking with uh, Don Wyckoff about this because we were looking at some stuff about baptism. And I believe in baptism, don't get me wrong, I'm just saying. But... In the scripture, it says, uh, he, he's talking to Nicodemus, and he says, you know, you've got to be born again. Well, how, what am I going to do? Go back in my mother's womb. And Jesus said, he just dumbed it right down, and he said, look, you've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Yes. Now, we have always said, well, that the water birth is natural. Well, why would Jesus tell you you had to be born of the water? You can't be born any other way. You couldn't be here if you weren't born of the water. And he's talking about baptism. And what is baptism really all about? And that was the thing that I got, was getting to is that baptism is immersing yourself totally in Jesus. It isn't just about having your sins washed away. And that's the deal. We have, we have dumbed it down to just a, you know, a religious ritual to where you, get, you need to be baptized. Yes, you, you should be baptized. But you should know why you're being baptized. You're being baptized into your identity. Right. You're being baptized into everything right. He is, is who you're supposed to be. Right. Woo, hallelujah. I'm talking about miracle working power that is in the body of Christ. And we have dumbed it down to some ritual or some theological action, thinking that that satisfies God. Well, you're going to go to heaven, but you're, we, He wants us to function down here as Jesus in this earth. Yes. With all of the capability and all of the potential and all of the power. Yes. Praise the Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. So here's what I'm saying. Jesus, Yeshua, the branch, is the way back to the tree of the God, of the tree of life. And the tree of life is God. Yes. He is God. It is God. That's why we see what we see in the temple. That's all that's all about. And I, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'll get ahead of myself here because I get excited. Praise the Lord. But look at Zechariah again, chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. 
Church, we're, we're living in such an exciting time. It's hideous. Yes. It's ugly. It's nasty. It's, you know, na we just, you, you hate to even listen to junk anymore. It's, yes. it's so divisive and so hateful. And yet, that is what, where God moves the greatest. That's where his light will shine the yes. brightest. That's where his people are going to reign and rule in this earth. And, uh, yes. and those that are so desperate and don't even know why they're desperate are going to be, they're going to see a light. We're going to see some of the most evil people transformed. Yes. Yes. Such were some of us. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people of pure language that may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. That's great, but it's not what I want. Zechariah chapter 3, 8 through 10. It's okay. Zephaniah, he's good. We know it's good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I kept looking for the one I was looking for, thinking, well, we'll get there eventually here. But how, here now, O Yahshua, Joshua, the high priest, right? This is where we were a while back. Thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Yes. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, Yeshua, yeah. upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Now, if you go to the book of, uh, of Revelation, you'll see those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. Yes. Amen. So the seven eyes, behold, I will engrave the, engra the graving thereof. In, in the Hebrew, it says facets. We call it, we're saying eyes here, but he's saying there's seven facets of the Spirit of God. And they're in this branch, right? Saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So I said before, zimak uh, is a Hebrew word for, it's the root word that means to sprout or to blossom, to bear, to, to, to prosper, to branch out, to spring forth. So the zimak is that which sprouts up, that which grows, that, that branches out, that springs forth and blossoms. Amen. Zechariah 6 and verse 12. Praise the Lord. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now, in the book of Zechariah, it's prophesied that the Messiah, he will be the one who in the days of his kingdom will build God's temple, right? We are the temple of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That prophecy gives him a name. The branch. Yes. Amen. So the name of the Messiah, the name of Yeshua, is the branch. Yeah. But what it actually says, behold the man whose name is the Zimak. <laughs> the name of Messiah is Zimak. And that means that his life is the sprout or the blossom, the branch that springs up from the earth. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The prophecy goes on. For he shall grow up out of his place. In other words, his name will be Zimak because he will branch out from his place. Now let me, where was the tree of life? In the garden, in the east. Not this is. We think we think of Jerusalem. We think of Israel as this place in the Middle East, and we think of the Garden of Eden as being some kind of ethereal thing. No, it was here on Earth. It was in a geographic location right here on Earth. He even gives us rivers that come out of it and pass by. Well, <laughs> praise the Lord. The Garden of Eden is right there in Jerusalem, in that area. That's where the Garden of Eden was. 
You can argue with me about it if you want to. I don't really care. But the reason I say that is because Abraham's grave, his burial place, is in Hebron, which is, was part of Israel. And it's been kind of divided and back and forth between the Israelis and the Arabs, and now they, they have joint occupation of it. But that's where his, his grave is. And the Hebrew uh, historians and archaeologists say that's where Adam is buried, in the same place. That's why Abram wanted that burial site. Now, remember, these guys, you, we think of it now thousands and thousands of years later. But you go down to Noah. Noah, uh, you know, when, when Methuselah died was when the flood came. Methuselah was a contemporary of Adam's. So Noah knew everything about Adam, right? Because he knew Methuselah. So he tells his sons, his sons tell his sons, they know where these people are buried when Adam died. They knew where he was buried. They know all, they know this stuff, right? So that's what, that's what they're saying. Abraham is buried in the same place where Adam is buried, and that's Israel. So the tree of life was in Israel somewhere. So his life will start out as a small shoot coming up from the earth, it says, like a small plant. But the effect of his life on the world is going to grow. So there's a, there's a uh, symbiotic kind of way of looking at this. Uh, on the one hand, he is the tree of life that grew up out of the earth yes. in the east, the east of the garden. But he's also... God that grew up out of this little town in Israel. Born with a dirt body. Yeah. Right? But the Spirit of God, the fullness of God dwelled in him bodily. Yeah. So, the effect of his life on the world is going to grow yeah. from the time that he comes up out of this little place in Israel. So much so that it will transcend the place of his ori origins. I think... Again, think of this, this tree of life, Jesus, birthed here, tree of life is here. I mean, if you can do that, that's, what I'm, that's where I'm thinking when I'm doing this. So I, I hope you can get into my weird head here. Praise the Lord. But it, 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 on the world, it's going to grow so, so much so that it's going to transcend the place of his origin, and it will cover the entire earth. His life is going to blossom. The branch of the tree of life. Amen. John 14, verse 13 and 14. John 14, verse 13 and 14. Praise the Lord. I told you I'm taking you on a really weird path here. But because it's so weird, maybe some of it will stick with you where just if I just come out and said some stuff. And for, what, for one thing, for sure, your, your sore rear end from something so long will remind you of something. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. He already told us we have his name. And whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do that. The Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. Chapter 15, verses 4 through 8 now. Still John. John 15, 4 through 8. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Now remember we have a name, we're connected. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. The vine is just, it's the trunk, it's the tree. Amen? I mean, if you look at the literal translation, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them up and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. Yeah. Herein is my Father glorified, yeah. that you bear much fruit. Yeah. So shall you be my disciples or my followers. Yes. Praise the Lord. So the blossoming, 
blossoming of his life will fill the world with its fruit. The fruit of everlasting life. The tree of life. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about anybody. I say, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. I'm excited. Praise the Lord. It is true for everybody who receives him. For all who really know him. Amen. He is the Simak of our lives. Praise the Lord. John 14, verse 4 through 6. And whether I go, ye know. <laughs> this is just crazy. And the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. Yes. The truth and yes. the life. No man comes unto the tree but by me. Yeah. Back to the tree, man. Back to the, tree. the branch that came forth. Yes. Yeah. That's where I'm wanting you to go. The same place. Back to the tree. Yes. Back to the tree of life. Back yes. to God. Yes. He's God in the flesh. That's why he's called the branch. Yes. The son of God. Yes. The branch of God. And we are branches yes. looking for the tree. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. So he has to continually grow. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The effect of his life should always be increase. Yes. His name is Zimak. And we are miraculously birthed and raised up and seated together with him in the tree. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. Yes. I know maybe I'm reaching, but man, I can't help it. It makes sense to me. It makes perfect sense to me. Amen. Yes. To sit with him in heavenly places. God is the tree of life. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Why the tree of life? God gives us eternity. That's life. That's real life is eternity. It's not... 75 years or 85 years, that's, that's just a blink of the eye. Yeah, true. So why does he give, give us eternity? Why does he give us the tree of life? Because the purpose of our existence is to know God. Yes. Eternity is the time it takes to know God. Ron, we're just little kids. We're just little infants crawling around. We haven't even started. <laughs> lifetime. A lifetime is just the beginning of eternity. Good and evil, you can, you can know here and now in the earth realm, in the natural. We all know it. Doesn't take any effort. All you got to do is open your eyes in the morning. Yeah. And it's right there whispering in your ear and staring you in the face. Yeah. All of God takes a tree of life. Yeah. God is the tree of life. Yes. And Jesus is the way back the way to eternal life. Yes. Revelation 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes what? The flesh. Mm -hmm. Right? The knowledge of good and evil. Yes. To him, you overcome the knowledge of good and evil, what are you going to give? The tree of life. Yes. You get to eat from the tree of life. Yes. I'll give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let me. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. Zechariah chapter three, verse eight. A few more scriptures here to get us into the end of this. But Zechariah three and eight again. See, God, it's so amazing. God, uh, he takes us on this really 
bizarre, wild, strange trip, and we get to the end of it, we go, my God, it's so simple. Why so complicated about that? Our Western way of thinking, I don't know, maybe the same with the Eastern way of thinking, but it's just like we, we complicate things so much. The tree, the uh, gardens over here, we're down here. And, uh, come on. It's, it's just right there in front of us. Just babies can understand it. Maybe not all the intricacies, but they, we know. See, even with just the limited knowledge we have, we know we need Jesus. He's the, he's the answer. The way to the Father is the only way there, the only way to eternal life. But all of these other metaphors, all these other stories, all these other realist uh, pictures that he gives us makes it come alive, makes it more real to us. That's what I'm hoping. I'm not just trying to confound you with a bunch of weird words. I, I want it to stick. I want it to last. I want it to when the next time it comes, we go, yeah, wait a minute. I've seen that. I know better than that. Hear now, O Yahshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Yes, yes. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Yes. Matthew 2, verse 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. Now watch this. It never ends, I'm telling you. These could go on for weeks. I know you're thinking... An hour and a half, plenty. Right. <laughs> but in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Mm -hmm. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine. Yes. I'm the trunk. Yes. You're the branches. Yes. And he that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For yes. without me, you can do nothing. Right. So why the branch? For one, he would appear on earth in littleness, yes. right? In weakness. And he would grow up as a shoot or a sprout, the prophecies say. Mm -hmm. He would be born among us on the tree. Mm -hmm. His presence on the earth would then grow greater and greater. The Hebrew word for branch is netzer. Nazareth means the place of the branch. Mm. And when you add the ending to netzer, it becomes netzeret. Netzeret. Mm. The real name of the place we know as Nazareth. And it was considered a nothing place. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Why would God choose it? He loves to choose the unlikely. I'm telling you, church, when I was thinking about this and I thought about my life, you know, in the early 70s, after I got out of the service and I, was, I, I lived out in Colorado, I attended bar and worked in restaurants. I was smoking dope all the time, partying. That's all I did. I ended up moving out to the East Coast, and I was living in Pennsylvania. And I was probably 25, maybe, if that. And a buddy of mine, who I was getting high with all the time, and we had a doctor, Dr. Brown, 
and we could go get quaaludes from him. He was a regular doctor, an MD, but he was crazy. And he'd give you prescriptions. All you had to do was show up. So, I'm, you know, I'm a little nervous. I need something. And he'd prescribe them for you. You could get them. I don't know if anybody ever done it, but they're downers. They're like, they'll knock you out. So we were doing those and smoking dope, and we went to a Pentecostal revival. I swear to God, I'm, I don't know how God did not burn that building down with me in it. It was in Green, or no, it was in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. And I lived across the, in uh, Greencastle, Pennsylvania at the time. But one guy was a believer, and he wanted us to go with him. Well, we were all high and everything. He didn't care. He said, come on. And I mean, there were people talking in tongues. I thought I was having a trip. I thought I was hallucinating. I probably was, but I mean, they were, people were shouting and jumping and running and talking in tongues. And all I could think was, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Something bad's going to happen in this place. I can feel it. And I'm just saying, the reason I'm saying that is because 20 years later, well, not 20 years later, 15 years later, I'm in a Pentecostal church in East Texas standing down there talking in tongues yeah. <clears throat> filled with the Holy Spirit yes. the, un, the most unlikely guy I mean if you knew me before I wasn't an evil person I was just self indulgent I was just totally self absorbed just get, me, just get me high and I'm good just party and you know but God saw something had any, anybody else, with the exception maybe of my mother in her wildest hopeful dreams, that I'm out to amount to something other than an ex-convict, or who knows what, was God. Yes. Because he saw the end from the beginning. Yes, he, he knew me before the foundation of the world. Yes. Yes. And it's true of so many people. We, 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 we look at people and we think, oh, my God, you know, they're 30, they're whatever, they're, they're this, and they're, they're, their lives are just, they're, they're going to just, you know, they're going to bust hell wide open. You don't know that. They may end up being the most on fire for God that you'll ever find. I'm telling you. That's, and that's what God's trying to get us to understand. We cannot overlook them. We can't just turn down our nose at them and just say, oh, I can't deal with this. No. Praise the Lord. God never gave up. That's right. And he never gives up. Thank you, Lord. That's why the guy on the cross, yes. today you'll be with me in paradise. I'm sure his family thought the same thing. That jerk, he's never going to amount to anything. All he does, he, every time you get him out of one mess, he's in another. Yes. He said, we're here and we deserve this, but you don't. Right. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus yes. said, today, today. you're going to be with me in paradise. He does. It ain't over till it's over. Praise the Lord. Amen. So God loves to choose the unlikely. Because it's not about Nazareth. It's about what comes through Nazareth. See, it's not about us. It's not about who we are. It doesn't matter how likely or unlikely, how unperfect or imperfect or sinful. Only that we receive Eat from the tree of life. Take, eat. This is my body. Yes. And we can do that spiritually without that. Because whenever you do this, just do it in remembrance of me. Right. For whosoever receives him right. through that life, the tree of life, yes. the life of God comes. Yes. And from that life, he will branch out to the world. He said he gave us his name. And each one of us is called to be his Nazareth, his Netzerit, where he sprouts, where he blossoms out from, where he branches out from each one of us. The tree of life. Let's close with that prayer. It's a tree of life to those who grasp it. And happy are those who cling to it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are shalom. Bring us back to you, Adonai, and we will return. 
renew our days as of old. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a hand this morning. I'm telling you, he didn't give us all this for us to flounder around out here and feel guilty and ashamed and embarrassed and, and less than who we are. He's, he's given us all this to raise us up so that we will sit together with him in heavenly places and operate from our true identity, the branch of the tree of life, an arm of God to operate in this earth. That's who you are. You are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Yes, Ron. Yep. Redemption. It cannot be renewed. All this, as it, it just comes to the capital, into that point where it cannot be renewed. Amen. Where you receive Jesus, you receive his covenant. Yes. And it cannot be renewed. That's Amen. right. Praise the Lord. He took our name yes. and wrote it in the plan book of life yes, and gave his name to us. Mm -hmm. Our covenant name. Yes. Yes. We use that name with covenant power. That's right. Yes. That's right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's right. That's right. Amen. And that covenant. Everything that God is backs it up. So, I mean, I'm just saying, we, yeah, we look, I'm looking at people yep. that have the, the most power, yep. the most influence mm -hmm. of anyone on this planet. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about kings and presidents and rulers. They got nothing on you. Right. If we walk in our true identity. If we don't let the enemy come in and try to force feed us the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right. but we keep eating from that tree of life, yes. nothing will be impossible to us. And God's going to get his will accomplished in yes, this last day, and he's going to do it through us. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And it's exciting, man. I mean, we got a great opportunity to experience everything God yes. has. From, as freaky as it gets, oh, we bring sanity. We yes. bring the goodness and the glory of God into this world. Hallelujah. We're going to experience some mighty things, folks. Yes. Praise the Lord. He chose us for this very time. Give him one more hand. This amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. Just go in the power of his might. Amen.